forward Take another step Keep moving forward Take another step Take another step Keep moving forward Take another step Keep moving forward Take another step Take another step Don't let the fear that turns your feet to stone Just remember he'll provide Keep moving forward Just remember he'll provide I 
tie. So just remember he'll provide and keep moving forward. Hard to breathe, hard to know which way to go, and just how to proceed. And when it's dark, dark as night, and it's hard to see where this will lead. Don't give up the fight. And when you're feeling like you got nothing left inside, when you're feeling like you got nothing left inside. Then you'll know it's time. Then you'll know it's time. Then you'll know it's time. Don't let the fear that turns your feet to stone leave you feeling all alone. Your alibi up in the sky is watching with his shepherd's eye. So just remember he'll provide. Just remember, he'll provide. Keep moving forward. Take another step. Keep moving forward. Take another step. Take another. Thank you. 
Good morning, church family. Good morning. There is no better place to be than right here, right now, to, to worship and to give God praise and thanks and honor and glory for who he is and what he has done for us. As we go to prayer, we always like to pray for a different ministry in the area. Let's pray for Oxford Methodist Church, uh, the pastor and their leadership team, their efforts in reaching others for Jesus Christ, because we are not the only one who's trying to do that. And uh, so let's remember to pray for them. We always like to pray for our church family. You may have come to church today with uh, various needs, and uh, let's lift those up before the Lord and uh, trust Him that He would meet those needs. Pray especially for that individual, maybe your neighbor or your friend or someone who says, pray for me this week when you go to church. Uh, that is very important. So let's go to prayer and uh, let's also pray for those who are sick and not well, that God will touch them, restore strength to their body and uh, bring healing. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your goodness and your mercy towards us. We thank you for the blessings you have poured upon our lives in one way or another. But we realize today that, that past blessings cannot suffice, so we come to you with the spirit of expectancy, with our cups turned up, that you would pour us out a blessing, that our cups will be filled and running over, and that blessing would be passed on to someone else that we know. But we thank you and we praise you. We thank you for our church family today, for everyone here in your presence, for those who could not make it for one reason or another. We lift them all before you. We bring those needs especially, and we speak favor on their behalf that you would meet those needs according to your riches and glory. I pray for, for the United Methodist Church in Oxford, the pastor, their leadership team, their efforts in reaching others for Christ. Honor their labor, we pray, and we thank you. Be with Pastor Don as he would come in a while and, and share the message. I pray that you would give him the words that we need that we will be challenged for a closer walk with you. I pray for a worship team as they lead us in worship. I pray, O oh God, that as they lift their voices to you, that our hearts will be warm and that we will be blessed. Be with us as we are being faithful stewards to you today in our giving, in our tithes, in our offering. Bless it all for the furtherance of your kingdom. All of this we ask. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we worship.
Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, good morning. How are you doing? praise this morning.
God is awesome. He is great. You may be seated. Amen. Yes, we can clap for God. Oh, God is great. All the time. Yes. Good morning. My name is Barb. I'm a volunteer at Hope Community Church. It's time for Kids Zone, kiddos. Miss Leanne's calling you that direction. When you came in the door, you should have received a program. These do change every week, so we try and kind of give you something new every week to read um, in case you're interested in knowing that. Um, there's also this fun place to take notes. If you're like me, that's what helps me concentrate is by taking notes. Um, so on the back, we have some announcements and also some upcoming events. So, um, you know, check that out, read it. At the bottom is a connection card, and we do like every person to at least put their name on there every week and put it in the uh, blue box. That's just a, one way for us to connect with you and, and kind of have a little bit of back and forth. On the back is a way for you to talk to us if you want us to contact you about something, if you want us to pray about something, if you want to sign up for something like VBS, which I'll talk about in a minute. You know, just put a little note on there and drop it in the box. We do pray every week for all the prayer requests that are on there. So if you're a first time guest with us, fill out as much as you feel comfortable, bring it to me at the welcome table. And I have a, a first time guest gift for you, a book and some lip balm, because we live in Florida, we like our lip balm. Um, we just, another announcement, I, I announced this last week. Melinda, can you bring up the Wi-Fi slide if you ha are able? Yes. Our Wi-Fi information has completely changed, so you have to sign off of what we were doing before. Sign on to our new Wi-Fi HCC guest, and the password is community, lowercase, no quotes. So go ahead and put that in. Um, and so while you have your phone out, check in on Facebook because we like to give back. So every month we pick an organization that we are going to give back to. And so for every check-in on Facebook, we give a dollar to an organization. And this month's organization is Kids Central. And their, their office, their central office is local to Wildwood. And so we have partnered with them for years and years and years now. Um, they're a fabulous organization. They offer foster and adopting programs, family support programs, and abuse prevention programs. So it's our privilege to give back to them as they help families in the area. Ladies game night is Tuesday night and that's at Miss Allison's home. Miss Allison, will you, there you go, thank you. We, I have her address and phone number and information at the welcome table. Um, all ladies are welcome. It doesn't matter whether you come before or not come. We, we just have a fun night of, of games and fellowship and a little bit of food. So um, she does like RSVP, so she's prepared for how many are coming because depends on how many are coming as to what game we play and it's kind of fun so um, see me at the welcome table if you want more information about that and then the next Tuesday the 18th we will start our ladies connection group back up so we are meeting this summer for um, six different times we have a study that we're going through it's not too late to join um, and we do have some extra books so if you're thinking oh man I wish I would have gotten a book or I wish I would have signed up um, see me at the welcome table I have some information for you and we will be meeting on June 18th at 6 30 here at the church for the ladies uh, VBS is coming up July 7th through the 12th and I'm guessing that we cannot have too many volunteers to help with that so it is going to be held at, at First Baptist Church Oxford if you'd like to volunteer to help um, see me and I will point you in the right direction because Leanne is um, actually the one in charge of that so um, I think that's all my announcements make sure oh give give in you can text to give to our church 352-444-1771 you can put your offering in the blue box or we also have a giving portal through our website so stay after for pastries and coffee we love to kind of interact and get to know everybody and we hope you find the service relevant so we're we're in a sermon series uh called jeremiah the way of the exile and if, if you haven't figured this out, I, I love the book of uh, Jeremiah, and it's for multiple reasons. Uh, one, I find it incredibly relevant for our times. He, he answers these questions of how do I remain faithful 
in a pagan culture? And he answers other questions like, like, where do we go when we've lost our way? And so Jeremiah does this great job of bringing us back. The, the other thing that I really appreciate about the book of Jeremiah, and by the way, I recommend, like, like don't let this be your only feeding source. Like, actually read through the book of Jeremiah as, as we're doing this. Um, God, God can speak to you as, um, as well. I, I, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the power of, of the Word of God. So read th- through there, but as, as you read through, I don't think there's, there's not another Old Testament book where they invite us into the depths and the struggles of one of God's faithful servants. I, I mean, Jeremiah is like, like, he's like, God, why is this going on? And God, you tricked me into doing ministry. And it's, um, I mean, it's fascinating. And he lived to tell about this. Um, Jeremiah is not a robot. He, he's got these real emotions and he's, and he's going back and forth with God. And he's like, God, you told me to do this, but they're not going to listen to me. And, and God's like, go do it, Jeremiah. Um, <laughs> And he feels, and, and, and like many of us, he's, he's trying to make sense of a broken world. You know, because sometimes we, we read the scripture and go, okay, how do I live this out? Which, which brings me to the third reason why I love this book, is it invites us to use our imagination. And if you would ask me, go ahead and ask me. Um, if, if you would ask me what, What's wrong with the church in America? One of my top five would be that we're losing our biblical imagination. And when I say imagination, because some of you are like, what do you mean by imagination? Uh, Let me tell you. I don't mean make-believe, and I don't mean fantasy. There's there's no shortage of that in our world right now. Um, we've We've got plenty of that. Um, What I'm talking about is our ability to live, to act, and create based of what God has already done and what he has revealed as our future. Um, I I tell you, I could talk to pastors and I'll I'll say, well, what what about this? What if we did this? Oh, well, that's unrealistic. That doesn't work. I'm like, hey, I didn't write the book. (laughs) Go go back to Jesus. Um, Our our job is, is, is to to work this out. And, and Jeremiah, he does this great job. He, he paints this, this prophetic future of, of what God has for us. And I, and I think lack of biblical imagination is, is crippling us. Here, here's what evil leaders do. They paint a false reality. Here's what poor leaders do. They're focused on a world that was. Good leaders will guide people in a world that is, and great leaders will prepare people for the world that's coming. Right? And, and, and I think that's, that, that's our job as, as the church, to, to paint this picture, to, to live out the picture, not just as the world as it is, but what it will be like. And, and we're called to live in that light, because here's something that we know from the resurrection. God's future kingdom has broken into the present. Right? That, that is a reality. That's what the resurrection tells us, that new creation has begun. And when we lose that picture, we default to a consumer-only culture. We lose our creativity. And so we're just living off of, of sound bites of com, uh, consumerism. And we lose that God-given ability or that God-given mandate to create. Jeremiah 5.8, we have a picture of what happens when we consume, or let me say over-consume indiscriminately. Jeremiah 5.28 says this, They have grown fat and sleek. They know no bounds in, in deeds of evil. They judge not with justice the cause of the fatherless to make it prosper, and they do not defend the rights of the needy. In other words, God's saying in this overconsumption, they've lost the concern for the least of these. And by the way, God's not saying, hey, my people are, are physically obese. All right, that's, that's not what he's saying. Um, what, what he's saying is, is my people, they live and they consume without discretion. We all need to consume, right? I mean, you die if you quit consuming. 
But God's saying, my people are, are consuming everything. They're consuming everything in the culture. There, there's no discretion. And when you do that, you forget who you are and you forget who God is. And one thing that is consistent through this book is God's people lose their identity and they lose their ability to create a society of truth, a society of holiness, and a society of justice. I mean, that's not my words. Those are Jeremiah's words that this is what's going on. So here's what we're going to do because we don't want to do that, right? Everybody's with me on that? Okay. All right. So what we want to do is we want to keep God's prophetic vision of the future alive in our hearts. And so let's, let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 7. Uh, we're going to continue on this journey. Jeremiah chapter 7. It's right up there. And uh, you got Bibles in front of you. you got them on your phone. Um, you got passwords so you can connect. You're good to go. Jeremiah 7, beginning at verse 2. And, and, and I, this is one of the things that I really love about the book of Jeremiah is he doesn't, he's just not just giving Jeremiah lessons. He's like, Jeremiah, come on, let's go for a walk. I want you to come over here and here's, here's what I want you to do. He says, stand at the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word. So, so he's at the temple. He's at the entrance to the temple where people are coming in to worship, to sacrifice, uh, to connect with God. And he says, there proclaim, hear the word of the Lord. All right, this isn't just a, you know, here's my greatest, latest thoughts. It's hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah, uh, women included, who enter the gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. All right, so I'm going to invite you to do something that I've done every week since we started this sermon series. I want you to use your imagination. There's a method to my madness here. <laughs> I want you to see yourself, you're standing at that gate. And, and we, know, we know that armies are coming from the north. God says destruction's coming. And he's given them these promises. So we're standing at the gate with Jeremiah. Everybody there? All right, you're standing there, right? Picture, picture that gate. Use your imagination. It, it's, it's good for you. But I, And I want you to do something. I want you to hear Jeremiah's words. Allow them to speak to you. Allow them to transform you. The, the reality is there's power in the living and active word of God. That's, that's what the Bible tells us. I want us to see this not just as a story that happened, but a story that you're invited to. In fact, you've heard me say this before, the gospel is an invitation to exchange story. I was going my own way. I was living a different story. And God came to me with the gospel, with, with the good news, and he gives this invitation to a better story. So there's, there's an invitation. And, and I want you to see yourself in the story because any Jewish worship, Christian worship that's really good invites you into the story. Think, think of those of you that went to the Passover meal that we had. They, they tell you in the Passover meal, see yourself as being delivered. See yourself as being rescued. So here we are. Um, we're at the gates. And, and at the gates, Jeremiah, speaking for God, asked people to make a change. The biblical word for this is what? Repentance. All right, go to, the, go to the desk afterwards. She'll tell you what you get. All right. Um, now, when we say repentance, this isn't just confession of sin. This isn't like, yeah, I did that. But, but this is an authentic change of life that only can take place with a heart that is submitted and transformed by God himself. All right, that's... That is, is how um, repentance works. And by the way, the, the gospel is not just a message, or excuse me, the gospel isn't a message of, hey, you failed, now do better. All right, that's, that's not the gospel message. It's not, you failed, now do better. It's a message about 
in my failure, there's a God that is able to rescue, to redeem, to restore, and to transform despite my failing. The gospel, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It's God's ability to make things right. And you know, my struggle might be yours. My tendency is to trust in something else. Trust in my own abilities. Trust in some kind of power thing. Trust, trust in the latest, greatest, you know, whatever it is. Trust in that. And Jeremiah has a clear message here. He's saying, he's talking to the people that are at the temple. These aren't, these aren't the heathens. I mean, they are, but they're not. Um, he's talking to the people that are at the gates. And he says, it's not God you're trusting in. He says, you're, you're trusting in deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It's, it's almost like it's a magical incantation, right? If, if we say it enough times, then, you know, the evil's going to run off. Um, and we can do that, right? We, we, can, we can add words. We can add the words like, in God we trust. We can say the words, one nation under God. Or we can, we can pray whatever we want and say, in Jesus' name. Well, as long as we do that, then God's cool, right? God's like, hey, that's what I wanted. You, you, you got it. Jeremiah is saying that that's really deceptive because when I say in the words in Jesus name I mean that's like if you if you left here and you know and you go rob the store and you say and I robbed this store in the name of Don Winters no 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 I, I I have nothing to do with with whatever you just did in there all right um and and Jesus is like don't don't attach my name to to whatever you do. Attach my name to the things that are me, or of me. And so Jeremiah is going to point out um, that God's people, they've become like the culture. And you know how you become like the culture? You just consume everything that the culture has. Specifically, he says this. He says, and there's a promise in here. He says, for, for if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one another, if you don't oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, these aren't really, really difficult things, right? Like, hey, quit hurting people. Um, or shed innocent blood in this place. And if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, now, let me pause because here's, here's the danger. At least for me, you guys can figure out if it's the danger for you. The danger is for me to not stop and ask, how does this apply to me? How, how, does, how do I do these things? Because I can, I can walk through this and, and I can say, well, I know how it applies to Judah. Here, here's, here's what they did. Here's, here's what was going on. Here's the practices. I, I know I can apply this to the evil people across the political aisle. I, I figured that out. I, I mean, I just go to a coffee shop in the morning and I'll be told how that works. The greatest danger in my life isn't usually the culture that I despise. It's the culture that I become comfortable with. It's the culture that, that, I, that I like because that's where I'm going to overlook something. And as I think about this, you ever flip through the Bible and, and, and read something and you're just like, man, that was stupid. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to be honest. I mean, if, if read through the book of Judges and you'll be like, what the heck's wrong with these people? But you know, as I, as I look through this, I'm, I'm not convinced that the people of Jeremiah's day are any less intelligent or more inherently evil than, than our current generation, our current age. I think most of them, I think most of them, I, I could be wrong on this, I think most of them just kind of looked around and said, this is how we do worship. This, this, we're, we're, we're good practicing Jews. 
Th this is what everybody else does. And, and so they learned how to serve God with, within a culture. And I think we can do that, right? We, we can say, okay, this is, this, is how we do, this is how we do Christianity. And Jeremiah is going to step in and, and say to the people there, you're not living consistently with the prophetic vision that God has for you. I, I mean, it, it's almost like he needs to go, hey, you're the people of Israel. You're the people of God. You're to be that one nation that, that points to every other nation of this is what it means to be the people of God. You've forgotten who you are. You've forgotten who you serve. And God makes them a promise. He says, it, you know, amend your ways. It, it, it's incredible because, like, I'm flipping through the pages. You ever, you ever flip through the pages where, where you know, God does this and, and the people go, okay, we're going to repent. And then the next page, and like, like, you ever go, man, it's a good thing I'm not God. <laughs> Be like, I'm, I'm done. You know. He says, then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. And he says, behold, you, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. And, and he says to him, he says, will you steal? Will you murder? Will you commit adultery? Will you fill, swear falsely? Will you make offerings to Baal? Will you go after other gods that you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we're delivered? Only go, to go on and do all these abominations? And he says, has this house which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. And the context isn't what's just going on in the temple, but God's telling the people, he's saying, hey, you don't, you don't just live however you want and then come to the temple like it's a hideout. The temple isn't a place to hide. In fact, I think there's something way more important. We don't, we don't come to hide our sins from God. And by the way, I mean, it doesn't work out really well. You know, when you confess to God, God's like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't see that. All right? But, but, but uh, there's not enough leaves in the world to hide our sin and shame. Okay? And what, what we do is, is we hide from God when God says, give those to me, I'm the God who can forgive. I'm the God who can transform. I'm, I'm the God that can change your life. And again, let, let's follow along with Jeremiah because he's going to invite us to use our imagination to continue to use that. Because the people are thinking, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like they think God's bluffing, right? He's not bluffing, okay? God's not bluffing. He says, he says come, come with me to Shiloh. Uh, verse 12, Jeremiah 7, it says, Now go to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. And now because you have done all these things, declares the Lord, and when I spoke to you persistently, you did not listen, and when I called you, you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the, to the house that is called by my name and in which you trust and to the place that I gave to you and to your fathers as I did in Shiloh. All right, so journey with him. You're tracking, right? We're, we're in Shiloh now. We're going to take a good look around. Look around. You know what you see? Nothing. You're not going to see anything. It is a barren, desolate wasteland. So what is this place, Shiloh? What, what happened there? And then why does God say, okay, take this journey, go to, go to Shiloh? Well, Shiloh, um, depending on the context, it, it could, could have a slightly different meaning. There's one where it points to the Messiah directly. But it's literally this, this place of rest where, where God chose to, to rest, where he said, okay, Shiloh is, is where I first put my name. So let's do a little history here. 
So before Jeremiah's time, before there's a temple, before there's a Jewish monarchy, in the book of Exodus, God gave instructions to the Israelites, right? He said, he said hey, make this tabernacle, and within the tabernacle, there's, um, there's going to be the Ark of the Covenant, which would represent the, the presence of God. And, and from that place, the presence of God, God said, and let them make me a sanctuary, and I will dwell with them in their midst. How cool is that? God's like, hey, do this, and I'm going to be in your midst. How, how many of you say, yeah, we want God in here? Okay, well, the cool thing is, is he's already in here. Um, and then ex Exodus 25, 22, he says, there, this place, the Ark of the Covenant, I will meet with you, and on the Ark of the Testimony, I will speak with you. God of the universe, he's, he's going to speak with us. And so this, this tabernacle, it, it comes to rest in Shiloh. And for the Israelites, this would be like the temple. It would be the one ge geographical location on earth in which God said, I'll dwell with my people, I'll, I'll meet with them, which is quite, quite incredible. Think about this. The, the, the God who's, who's timeless, who's boundless, says, I'm going to confine myself to this spot to meet where, where you are. Kind of sounds like a precursor to Christ, right? I'm going to meet you where you're at this time, this place. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. Um, so God's presence is in Shiloh. And God's people, if we back up, they're at war with the Philistines, um, who are ready to do some serious damage uh, to the Israelites' um, army. So back in Shiloh, we have a priest named Eli. And Eli, who has two sons that are not the sharpest tools in the shed. Um, by, by the way, I'm being nice about that. R read through. I mean, the Bible calls them worthless. So I'm, I'm kind of being kind here. Um, they're not the sharpest tools in the shed, but somehow they found themselves in leadership. Seems to be standard operating procedure. So let's zoom in. First, first Samuel, this is where uh, God tells Jeremiah to go. It says, and when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, First Samuel 4, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, and it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. And so they went to Shiloh, and they brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who's enthroned on the cherubim, and two sons of Eli, Phineas and Ferb, no, uh, Hophani and uh, Phineas, were there at the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so let's think this through. We've got your imagination working right now. They're surrounded by, by the Philistines. They're like, hey, we're, we're toast. And they go, hey, we got a great idea. I mean, they don't stop. They don't pause. They don't say, hey, God, what do you want us to do? You see the enemies here. Eli's sons, not the sharpest tools, um, they say, let's take the ark into battle. And this is going to bring us victory. Sort of makes sense, right? Other cultures do that. They, they take their God. They take their good luck charms. They, they take those things and they go into battle. They trust in these idols and their symbols. Now, continue to imagine that we're there because this is exactly what happened. The people became energized. They're, they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant. They're bringing it out to the battle. Here you are. You're ready to fight. And, and, and they start shouting. And they're talking, our God is going to give us victory. We're going we're gonna to destroy them. And the enemy, I mean, just, just read, read, through, um, read through that passage, chapter 4. The enemy becomes terrified. The enemy is like, what are we going to do? They brought their God into this battle. And they're like, okay, we got to muster up strength. We, we know what this Hebrew God did to the Egyptians. And so the Israelites go out into battle, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, bringing God into the battle. And you know what happened? Philistines annihilated them. It's not what you were expecting, right? It was like, hey, the battle belongs to the Lord. We're, we're bringing God into here, and he's going he's gonna to give us victory. He, they get annihilated. And the Ark of the Covenant is actually 
captured by the Philistines. That doesn't work out real well for them. Um, be, be careful what you do. Um, it doesn't work out well for them for capturing the Ark of the Covenant. And you know what's the craziest part of this is God's not passive in this. The psalmist tells us this, Psalm 78, 60, and 61. Talking of God, it says, And he forsook his dwelling in Shiloh, the tent where he dwelled among mankind, and he delivered his power to captivity. Isn't that crazy? God of the universe goes, I'm, I'm going to allow myself to be captured here. Sounds a little bit like Christ, but we'll back up again. And First Samuel 4, 2, it's like, like one of the saddest verses in the entire Bible. First Samuel 4, 2, it says, And she said, The glory has departed from Israel. The ark of God has been captured. I, I, I don't know if we could grasp the magnitude of that. It, it, it would be like if we would just say, The Holy Spirit has left us. God, God has abandoned us. The, the glory of God is no longer in our presence. And I think there's a, there's a deep message that's going on for those that, that claim to know God. I think what God is saying here in Shiloh and, and what he's saying later in Judah is I'm not a magic charm. I am not a magic charm. The, 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 the words of God are not magical incantations. You don't get to use me. You don't just use my name and attach it to whatever you please. Later in the Bible, we would, we'll read, God is not mocked. He, he will not be mocked. And if you think about it, history is full of people that try to use God for their own purposes. If I'm super honest this morning, I fit in that category. I mean, how many of us said, God, here's what I want to do, and, and I want you to bless that in, in Jesus' name. And I'm not knocking you for, you know, because there are times where like, God, I don't know, but I think it's this, and, and I'm going to go in this direction. But how many times do we, do we use God? Or how many times do we treat God like he's a cosmic vending machine? Like, okay, God, this, this is what I want. My role, well, vending machines don't do this. Uh, for some reason, I was going to pull like that, and the vending machine was going to go like that. But my role is to do this, and then it sometimes drop unless it gets stuck on the swirl thing. And, and, and your role, God, is to deliver. And God goes, no, I'm not a cosmic bellhop. I'm not, ding, ding, hey, we need you, God. That's, God says that's, that's not how it works. You know what that is? That's consumption. <laughs> not only do we consume the culture, but we just, we, we consume God. That's not biblical imagination. But here's something crazy. Here's the beauty of the gospel. Although God is not used, he freely gives himself. Isn't that crazy? I mean, Jesus, who he gave himself on the cross to users, people that use him, that, that, that use his name, that, that, that use God. And from that, from that point, he, he says, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you new desires. I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to put my desires in your heart. And, and there's an invitation in that where God says, I'm going to invite you back. I'm going to invite you back into repentance and to walk in forgiveness. How, how incredible for people that regularly break the covenant, regularly use God. And while we can look to the Old Testament, we can go, man, look, look at the, the, the priest, he failed. The, the, the sons of the priest, the, the sons of a judge, they failed. And then we get to the New Testament and it tells us we have a new high priest. We have a judge, the one who's going to judge the living and the dead. And guess what? He's a son. He's the son of David. He's the son of man. 
He is the son of God. His name is Jesus. And while others walk around without biblical imagination and they attempt to do things on their own, their own way, by their own strength, the son of God says, I can do nothing of my own initiative. Do do you see the dramatic change? God, here's what we want. Here's what you're going to do. God in the flesh. Son of God goes, yeah, I can't do anything unless it's something I see my father doing. I'm, I'm going to rely on him. I'm going to do what my father wants. I'm going to live in light of the prophetic vision of what God dreams of. And if you want to ever figure out what God dreams of, just go to Revelation 20 and 21, and you, you got a picture of, of what God dreams of. And that's how we live as exiles in, in a broken world. And this Jesus, he doesn't only cleanse the temple, he is the temple. He is the the presence of God. He is where the sacrifice for sin is made. And this Jesus, it's amazing. Because while others with no biblical imagination for defeating the powers of the world, for defeating the powers of sin and death and oppression, Jesus comes in and he doesn't even lift a sword. You're like, Jesus, that's not how we do things around here. Yeah, there's going to be some changes. <laughs> and without lifting a sword, the Bible tells us that Jesus canceled the re- record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. Here, here's what he did to the powers that be. The Bible tells us he disarmed disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing them over them, over them in him on a cross. Crazy, a way of a cross. And Jesus had a clear picture of the future. Here's my question. Are we going to live in a world as it was? Are we just going to live in a world as it is? Are we going to live without denying those things? Because the the prophets didn't deny those things because they even said, hey, look and see what happened here. But will we live in light of the prophetic vision where at some point in time, people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation will stand before God. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more sickness, no, no, no more death. We'll be in right relationship with him, right relationship with one another, and right relationship with whatever the created order is at that point in time. Do we live in light of that? And do we live today in light of what is coming? And then walk in the way of Jesus. I think sometimes it takes us to be creative. You know, what, what, what does that look like? when we disagree with all these different things? How how, how do we live that out? I think we live that out by starting saying, he's in charge. Jesus is what unites us. We've come together in, in no other name but Jesus Christ this morning. Let's walk in his ways. Let's walk in his forgiveness. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for people like me that, that have used you have, have sought sought you for our own purposes thank you that that you forgive us you, you wash us, you cleanse us, you redeem us and then you put us back into community to, to make a difference to point people to you thank you Lord Jesus and I, and I pray today that that we have a room full of people that, that say, I surrender to you, Jesus. I receive your forgiveness. I receive what you did on the cross for me and my salvation. And, and I'm going to live in light of the glorious future that we have in you. Lord God, we love you today. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
focus focuses on Jesus. There is power in that name. Oh, come on. You can be seated for just a minute. So we, we started something recently on the second Sunday. Uh, we've been calling it Commissioning Sunday. Uh, when, we, when we started the church, uh, we talked about things like um, we're not going to judge ourselves by our seating capacity, but by our sending capacity. Who are we sending back out? And, and we've decided we want to be very intentional uh, to actually commission people and, and send them um, out into the community. Leanne, you want to come on over here? And um, many of you know um, Leanne is, is our children's director, and which is really awesome because when we were going to plant a church, there were things like I knew I could never do, like, like, like worship or run the, the children's ministry. And so when those people come along, you're like, you're the real hero. Um, and so we're, that's awesome. But Leanne doesn't just serve Jesus in this building. And so Leanne, I'm, I'm, I'll ask you kind of a strange question. How would you finish this uh, statement where um, that if, if, you were, if I were to say, I'm a missionary cleverly disguised as... And go ahead and tell us how you're cleverly disguised and how you see yourself serving Jesus in the community. Well, I would be cleverly disguised as an insurance agent. <laughs> so, um, but what I've really seen God working is just with the coworkers that I have. There's two other ladies that work with me. Renee, who's actually um, came to the tea, if you guys were here for that. And then um, we have a new girl, Lisa. And both of them come from kind of a very strict Catholic background. Um, and uh, so I, I'm the go-to God's girl, is what they call me. So anytime they have questions or concerns or, you know, uh, Renee is... Um, her son, Gio, will be coming to VBS, and she wanted to make it clear that that's what she wants. She wants to start getting her son really involved into church, and she's just really, they're both very kind of questioning some things, and um, so, but I'm, they say that my answers free them from some of the restrictions that their Catholic traditions um, kind of restrict them on. Um, and so, you know, that's just, to me, it, it's always shocking when God says, okay, open your mouth, and these words come out, and you're like, uh-huh, where'd that come from? But um, it, it is really amazing to see what God's doing with my coworkers through me right now and just how open they are to, to what he has to say. So that would be me. That is cool. I, I just get called pastor, but you're go-to God's girl. I, I mean, that, that is awesome. Um, can, a, can a few of you come up here um, and, and put hands on Leanne? And, and I just want to pray quickly before we, we head out. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Leanne. And uh, Lord, what a blessing. And how cool is that that others are calling her God's go-to girl. And, and so we thank you for that, Lord. We ask that you would bless her. Um, we're so thankful that she sees herself on mission for you. Um, give her, Continue to give her words of wisdom as she speaks. Um, thank you that she is a part of, of Hope Community Church. And I ask that you would bless her as, as she seeks to, to serve you and to make you known, to make your name great. Again, thank you for her, Lord. And, and we bless her. We, as, as a body of Christ, send her out into community on service or in service for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Feel free to uh, encourage Leanne.
And have pastry and coffee. 